Hey everybody, this is Dr. Mark Hyman. Welcome to the Fat Summit. And uh, I have as my special guest today, Dr. Barry Sears, who's been an inspiration to me for decades now. And it was one of the first people in the field of nutrition to talk about food as medicine, not just as calories, as information that actually modulates your biology, and particularly hormones. And he, he was one of the first to really talk about the role of inflammation and diet and how food can be anti-inflammatory or inflammatory. And these concepts were so foreign when he talked about them over 20 years ago, and yet now they're actually at the heartbeat of medicine. And, and Dr. Sears is such a pioneer in the world of fat and understanding the role of fat in our bodies and has been a leader in this whole field, has written obviously the books we all know, The Zone, Mastering the Zone, uh, The Mediterranean Zone, his new book. And he's, he's just an incredible scientist with an inquiring mind. He's a former research scientist at the Boston University School of Medicine and MIT. He's been studying 40 years, studying fat. So what better guy to have talk about fat with us today? So, uh, Dr. Sears, I, I really know you've, um, you, before you, you wrote your first book, you were really inquiring about how do you prevent a heart attack for yourself? Because you had a lot of family members who had actually had heart attacks and you were concerned about it. So you wanted to dig into the research and find out, actually, you know, what do I do? For me, and uh, that was the sort of beginning of your journey. So tell us how that inspired you, and what it led you to, and how you began to connect the dots between food, and fat, and inflammation, and that whole story. Well, it really started out. And first of all, Mark, thank you for inviting me to your conference. I'm very honored. Uh, really, my story started out nearly 40 years ago, uh, when my father died in his early 50s from heart disease. Now he was a world class athlete. Wow. Uh, but his first heart attack occurred at age 39, and his final one, his third heart attack, at age 53. Not only did he die from heart disease, but all his brothers did, mm -hmm. as did my grandfather. So I realized at that date that I carried the same genes for early mortality from heart disease. That's kind of scary. <laughs> well, I say, but it's, it's a revelation saying the genes are there. You can't change your genes, but somehow you can change your expression. Mm -hmm. And that led me on a journey to be asked the question, how can I change the expression of the genes to decrease the likelihood of a heart attack? Well, I knew nothing about a heart attack or atherosclerosis, but I knew a lot about lipids. So oh. first thing I had to do to find out about uh, you know, heart disease. So I uh, you know, went to BU Medical School and started studying uh, the atherosclerosis. And it became very apparent to me at that point that really the culprit was inflammation. Yeah. At the time, in the it's early, not just a plumbing problem, right? It's actually inflammatory it was, problem. An inflammatory problem. At the time, we had two groups of people. They're still fighting. You had the inflammation guys and the cholesterol boys, and they're fighting tooth and nail back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> uh, and the cholesterol boys won only because there was a drug. Easier measure, much easier to measure cholesterol than to measure inflammation. But there was also a drug, right? Well, there, and, and there was actually. There was a drug, the 19th drug was called a statin. Right. The first 18 drugs are all lowered cholesterol, all increased mortality. Yes. So they were losers. Right. And so it's only well, with that's that. that's an interesting point, Barry, that the drugs that lowered cholesterol don't necessarily protect you against heart attacks because it's not the cholesterol that's the culprit, is what you're saying. Exactly. And why, and why would the statins be the first drug to do that? Because unbeknownst to anybody, they were also anti-inflammatory drugs. Mm -hmm. Just like the other drug that prevents a secondary heart attack is called an aspirin. Mm -hmm. Doesn't lower cholesterol, but does a real good job of lowering inflammation. That's right. So that that being on the aspirin, I said, there's the culprit, there's the key. Now, now can I just pause you for a minute? What's interesting yeah. and people don't realize is that the pathway that's regulated by aspirin is also regulated by fat. Exactly. Right. And, and that, was, that was the clue. It's saying, okay, now if inflammation is the key, what is the key factor in inflammation? And that's where the 1982 Nobel Prize in Medicine gave me the clue. Because mm -hmm. that was awarded for understanding how fats, certain fats, can be transformed in these incredibly powerful inflammatory hormones called acosmins. Yeah. So I left uh, you know, there and basically now started to focus my whole attention saying, how can I change the levels of acosinoids in my body to basically give me a greater chance of living a longer and better life? Yeah, so the, so the acosinoids are essentially these inf molecules that regulate inflammation that actually increase it or decrease it depending on which ones get turned on. And what your study found was that so much of it's regulated by the fat we eat. 
Exactly. Uh, that was my first thought. That was my simplistic thinking, my early days. It's just the fact. Yeah. Turns out it was a lot more complex as it usually is. Of course. It turns out it's just not the fact, which is true, and the types of fat, but one other factors. Uh, that is hormonal factors, particularly the levels of the hormone insulin. Yeah. And so basically that led me to now develop a, a secondary layer, and that is I had to develop a diet to help control insulin to help control the fats that control the inflammation. Well, tell us about that connection. How does insulin, which we think is connected to sugar, how does that relate to fat? Because it doesn't seem connected, right? Well, it's, it's not, not an ob uh, obvious connection, but it's a very interesting connection. And that is the, the fats, the omega-6 fats, are the ones that drive inflammation. But it's only one particular fat. It's called arachidonic acid. That's uh -huh. the bad boy. You uh -huh. need some, but definitely not too much. Right. And where insulin comes in is the enzymes that convert our typical omega-6 fatty acids in the diet, like linoleic acid, into a rocket like acid. Soybean, soybean oil, right? Or, yes. uh, right? Are basically now accelerated by high levels of insulin. So mm -hmm. unless you control insulin, your likelihood of controlling a costenoids are slim and none. This is like a big aha. So basically, if you eat sugar, it drives the fat that you eat into really bad products that cause inflammation in your body. If, the, if that fat is rich in omega-6 fatty acid, it's, uh, uh, it's like adding a lighted match to a vat of gasoline. Right. You get an explosion, an explosion of inflammation. So, so, so let me ask you this, because this is something I struggle with, Barry, is if you eat a diet that's very low in sugar, refined carbs, it doesn't spike insulin. I've written a lot of books on insulin and blood sugar. Like if you don't do that and you have the omega-6 fats, are they bad or does it matter? Uh, yes, it does. It's basically, it's, uh, <clears throat> as you add more omega-6 fatty acids in the diet, you're basically pushing, pushing, pushing those omega-6 toward their final destination, which is arachidonic acid. Uh, think of it as a, a water tower. The more water you put in the top of the tower, the higher the pressure. Yeah. And so, again, uh, it's really a twofold. I want to cut back on the omega-6 fatty acids and definitely cut back on the insulin. And then, basically, I've got a very good handle on how to control inflammation. So practically, like, what would people avoid to not eat too much omega-6 fats? Well, uh, really the things that are the cheapest source of calories in the world today. Vegetable oils, corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil. These are the richest sources of omega-6 fatty acids. Yeah. Omega-6 fatty acids were a very rare uh, minor component of the human diet until about 1920 when we learned how to extract vegetable oils rich in omega-6 fatty acids from seeds using gasoline. Yeah. So our problem really started with Henry Ford. No, oh, no. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I actually remember reading that like we've increased our intake of soybean oil a thousand times since 1900 which has and, never and, been happened in human history before. So how do exactly. our bodies handle this? So we talk about global warming. What we've had here is basically inflammation warming at a <laughs> super hyper scale. Yeah. And you know, we do need some omega-6 fatty acids. Without inflammation, it's not inflammation is bad. We need some to help protect us from the hostile right. world. But when we have too much, it starts attacking our own body. The, the amount we need to minimum is about maybe half percent calories. Mm. And probably ideally maybe one to two percent at most of calories. And, of now, calories. and now how much is it? Now it's eight percent. Eight percent, and mostly what? Soybean oil? Exactly, because it's the cheapest source of calories known to man. And it's all GMO soybean oil. Well, it, I'm not too worried about that. It's just basically there's too much floating around the world. Yeah. And uh, so we have a, a problem there. Plus, it's compounded mm -hmm. by a corresponding decrease in our intake of long chain omega three fatty acids. These are the ones that basically you need a balance. You need a balance of omega-6 and omega-3. Now, uh, three generations ago, most Americans had an adequate balance. Why? Because no child could leave their home unless they had a tablespoon uh -huh, right. of cod liver oil, the world's most disgusting food. Yeah. It still is. But, that but one, now they, they deodorize it and flavored it, so it's actually you can take it. It's not so bad. Uh, it's still bad. It's still bad. <laughs> we don't take it. Right now, uh, th th three generations ago, our intake was about two and a half grams per day. Today, the average intake 
is about 125 milligrams. That's a 95% decrease in only three generations. Couple that with a massive increase of omega-6 fatty acids and make things even worse, a massive increase in insulin yeah. and you've got a problem. Yeah, so it's a combination of cutting back on the omega-3s, increasing the omega-6s from vegetable oils, and like an incredible increase in sugar and refined carbs, which jacks up insulin. So exactly. It's like the perfect storm it of definitely all these is. inflammatory diseases, right? Including obesity, heart disease, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's, hard, it's hard to name a chronic disease that's not driven by inflammation. Right. In fact, aging itself is an inflammatory process. If, exactly. And that's why I would say, you know, what we think of as normal aging is actually abnormal aging. It's actually disease and inflammation. So if you can shift your body to an anti-inflammatory state, you can literally delay or even stop the aging process. And the, the thing that which is key to, to uh, the whole argument is that you're able to take control of the expression of your genes. What you're now doing, you're transforming diet from a source of calories to gene therapy. Mm-hmm. It now becomes the X, X as the apex of basically biotechnology. Oh, gene therapy, this is so, say, hey, you can do it in your kitchen. Yeah. But we have to know the rules and be consistent. Yeah, so Barry, what you just said is like an atom bomb going off, right? It's like, wow, our genes are not our destiny. We have the capacity to turn on or off genes depending on what we eat. And that the most powerful tool we have to alter our gene expression is the stuff we put in our mouth every day, which is under our take, control. I wish I could take credit for it, but actually this comes back to Hippocrates. Uh-huh. Let food be your medicine, let yeah. medicine be your food. What is it's it? taken us 2,500 years to understand his wisdom. What does the Bible say? There's nothing new under the sun, right? It's exactly. Like, <laughs> so, and it's, uh, it's stunning. And this is, the, this is the foundation of functional medicine, which is understanding how to alter your gene expression by changing your environment, your thoughts, your exposure to environmental chemicals, your diet, your movement, everything, your it, relationships. It's very, very complex, but it all comes back to, as they said, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. All roads lead to basically lifestyle yeah. and how you control the quality of your life. That's right. You have to do everything. You can't say, well, I'll, do, I'll take A and B and forget C and D. Say, doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's not. It's not a multiple choice exam. <laughs> it's all of the above. <laughs> right. It's D. The answer is D. So you know the the, the idea of of um, the omega fats is just I want I want to go into a little bit more the omega three fats because it's something you've written a lot about. You've talked a lot about. You you even created products around this. And and I don't know if most people understand where we got our omega three fats from and all of a sudden why they vanished from our diet. Can you share a little bit about how that happened? Well, uh, for most of human, uh, mankind's history, the most easily accessible and most inexpensive source of protein was fish. Yeah. And therefore, uh, you know, fish you know, uh, can't make omega-3 fatty acids. Only pond scum can. That's right. It's, it, it's pond scum Algae. that made us human. And That's the right. fish are just very uh, uh, efficient accumulators of pond scum, these omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah. So uh, as long as we're balancing omega-6 intake and omega-3 intake, things are pretty good. But when they become out of balance, you basically have opened up a Pandora's box, a Pandora's genetic box, to mm-hmm. change gene expression, to basically change how hormones talk with their receptors, mm-hmm. to basically change everything that's otherwise a hunky dory situation into one that's saying, I don't know what's going wrong, but I don't know, I don't feel good. Right. So, so you know, when I look back at the history, it's like our omega 3s came from, like you said, fish. But like, even if you weren't uh, living by the ocean, if you were a hunter-gatherer, what were you eating? You were eating wild animals, which ate plants, and they converted that into omega-3 fats, right? So Exactly. Because this is why grass-fed beef is always superior to uh, corn-fed beef. Corn-fed beef is rich in omega-6 fatty acids because why? The omega-6 fatty acids and the inflammation they induce fatten the cattle up at a faster rate. You know, uh, grass-fed beef basically grow slowly. Right. Why? Because they're not being inflamed, their fat cells aren't being inflamed, and therefore you can't get them to market as quickly. That's right. So so with grass fed beef or wild uh, you know uh, animals are basically great sources of good quality protein, but they're much richer in omega three fatty acids than omega six fatty acids. And lower in omega six, right? Exactly. So, so it's not it's not actually what you you're not what you eat, it's what you eat what you ate ate. 
You are with eight, 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 eight. You're, 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 <laughs> Let the circle be unbroken. <laughs> and the, you know the uh, the beauty is that actually what you're saying is fairly simple to do. If we just remove the majority of the omega sixes and eat or more omega threes from fish or maybe supplements, and we'll talk about that in a minute, then then we can actually re construct the balance and modulate this. But before we get into that, I, I want to sort of come back to this concept of the hormonal effect of food, because this is something you really pioneered and you talked about. How do we actually alter our hormones, which are driving our weight, our metabolism, inflammation, and this whole downstream cascade? How do we actually think about that? Because when you think about food, most people think about, well, it's just energy, right? I mean, Coca-Cola came up with this concept of the Global Energy Balance Network, which is to inform citizens about the concept of calories in, calories out, that we should just exercise more and eat less and everything would be okay. And that Coca-Cola can be a healthy part of a normal diet as long as it's balanced with all the energy input and output, right? But what you're saying is something really different. It's not about that. that, that it's really about this hormonal, we call the hormonal hypothesis of metabolism. And it's not just about inflammation here, it's something else. So can you, can you talk to us about how you came to this concept and, and what it meant and how you actually uh, operationalize this in terms of therapies and treatments with people and how you've really taken this to the next level? Well, really, the reason I, I see it from a different perspective is that I come from a non-nutrition perspective. My background is really development of intravenous drug delivery systems for cancer drugs. Huh. And what you do with this, you try to keep the cancer drug in the zone. Too low of the cancer drug, you die of cancer. Hmm. Too much of the cancer drug, you die of the cancer. Hmm. You keep it in a therapeutic zone. Uh, now, hence I, I, the word that, the zone diet. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and that's how, the, you know, when I wrote my first book, my editor said, what do you want to call the book? And I said, we'll call it the therapeutic zone. And she said, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. She crossed out the word therapeutic and said, we'll call it the zone and hope somebody buys the book. Uh-huh. Uh, we both had very low expectations. Uh, uh, but Six million what, books later, it worked out. Uh, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> and, and the reason I went into science because I couldn't write. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Uh, but it's looking at now not your hormones, but again, uh, how they basically communicate. Think of hormones as a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, I, I couldn't live without my cell phone. Yeah. When it works. When it doesn't work, you throw it on the floor, you stomp on it and say, oh my God, I'll send it back. But that's what hormones do. They allow our cells. We have uh, 10 trillion human cells to communicate at great distances with great fidelity. Yeah. But inflammation can disturb that. Yeah. So now I can basically hormones increase inflammation. But now the inflammation caused by hormonal disturbances cause miscommunication between our hormones and every other cell in our body. Yeah. So it's a cascading aspect. So when we talk about insulin resistance... It's really a poster child for hormone resistance. Yeah. Because the insulin's binding to the receptor, but the signal's not getting through. It's like the network is down. So, like your cells are deaf to the effects of insulin. So, you and make so more it, and more insulin, and then you get more into trouble with the fats because then you convert more omega 6 to the inflammatory pathway, and then you're screwed, right? Well, That's yeah, hard. this is like, like, like the old Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? Can right. you hear me now? Right, right. But Barry, you know, here's the problem I have. Like, I, I've been studying this for years, and I've read thousands of papers. And when you, like, look at the literature, it's all over the place. Like, you've got exactly. some of the smartest guys at Harvard saying, drink, you know, soybean oil, because it's great for you, and it prevents heart attacks, and, like, get rid of saturated fats. And, like, and then you got other guys saying, you know, omega-6s are killing you. Guys at NIH saying we should not be eating that. Like, Hiblin and Ramson are saying, yep. you know, the research is showing us that that we actually should not be consuming so much omega-6s. And, and then everybody's reading the same literature and coming with different conclusions. How does that happen? Like, and how, who do we believe in? How does it work? It's, like, oh, it's like politics and religion. Oh my and there God. are three things in life which are very visceral. Uh, <laughs> politics, religion, and nutrition. Once you believe, you choose the data that supports your uh, hypothesis. And say, you know, don't confuse me with the facts. Because it's like, nutrition is just so complex. It's like, it is. And that's why you basically, you're always open to new ideas to say, how can I keep adjusting? Yeah. Adjusting the diet so that the individual is in position to basically now make the best use of the hormones and the genes they were given. Hmm. 
and using the diet now as a gene modulator to basically give you the best possible life that you can. So what, uh, about, what, is, about all, what about all this data that says like, you know, polyunsaturated fats should be replacing saturated fat and we should be increasing our intake of omega-6 polyunsaturated fat. And the literature that they cause inflammation is just shoddy. It doesn't really hold up when you look at it. I mean, and I'm I, like, I, guys, I, go, I, I, I go the other way. I say, you know, anytime I see a meta-study, a meta-analysis, uh, I think sausage. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. And anytime I, I see an epidemiological study, I say, well, why don't you do some real research? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, epidemiological studies are only give us an indication of a hypothesis yeah. to test out in clinical settings. Oh, that's so hard. It's so expensive. I say, well, just believe me. I, I come from Harvard saying, wrong. Uh, the, the fact is that you have to basically have a hypothesis of the literature can generate that and then go to the laboratory and do the experiments correctly. Right. Nowhere in, in science are experiments more poorly done than nutrition. It's hard. How do you control what people eat? You can give well, them a little to, purple pill or a blue pill, but it's hard to like control their diet. To, but to do so, you have to treat them like lab rats. Yeah. And that's what the studies I do. I treat them like lab rats. Mm -hmm. We give them to control all their food. Mm -hmm. And only then can you make basically a, any type of statement relative to nutrition. When you say, here, try to follow this diet, say you get regression toward the mean. People are going to eat what they want to eat. Right, right. And they're going to, and they're going to lie to you and tell you, what, what do you want to hear? Oh, oh yeah, it's fun diet. Come on, right. come on. It's, yeah, it's basically they want to please the researcher, right? Exactly. It's like, <laughs> and, what, and whatever the trend of the day is, they'll do if it's low fat or no meat or whatever. You know, what, what's interesting about what you said is that most people don't realize that not all research is the same, right? That, and this is something I talk about in my book, Eat Fat, Get Thin, which is we actually have to be smart about how we think about it. And yes, you know, we can get indications from research around populations where they observe people over decades and they see what happens as opposed to a true experiment where you give one group uh, a certain intervention, another group a different intervention, see what happens. It's controlled. That's called a controlled experiment. That's, that's more valid in terms of the cause and effect connection. But you know, you know, when we deal with humans, is we always get great studies when we deal with rats. Yeah. Well, we control their food completely. That's right. But humans, uh, you say, okay, uh, here's some dietary instructions, follow us. Saying, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I say. Being nice to your fellow man. How long is that going to last? It's hard. It's hard. How do, you, how do you actually control someone's diet for 10 years, right? Every day and look at the outcomes of heart attack. You can't, we can't even do that study. It's going to be, it would be billions of dollars. So they do well, this. but the billions of dollars would answer some questions they because we're, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars to treat the consequences Absolutely. of not knowing the answers. I'm with you. I'm with you, Barry, on this one. And you know, it's fascinating. I think with observational studies, you know, you could do a study where it said, you know, gee, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a study to see if 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 the sun comes up every morning when Barry wakes up, and I would find a hundred percent correlation. But you are not causing the sun to wake up. It just happened to wake up when you woke up. And what? What? <laughs> you're, you're my, I, I thought this. I thought the world revolved around you. Well, goodness you know, gracious! I'm I sorry to break the news. <laughs> uh, that's why you do experiments. Exactly, and so we've had we've had disasters like that. The Women's Health Initiative, where we we thought that estrogen and Premarin was God's gift to women that was going to solve all their problems, reduce heart attacks, prevent dementia, make them young, and it was like this sacred, I mean, I remember this woman coming up to me at Canyon Ranch when I worked there, and she said, you know, Dr. Hyman, you're talking about the risk of hormones, and that we don't have enough of good data about it, and that you're seeing indications that it could be harmful, and you should be cautious, but my doctor, my gynecologist said, if you don't prescribe hormones, it's malpractice, and I'm like, wow, and then the Women's Health Initiative came out, which was an experiment, actually, where they actually gave one group hormones and another group they didn't. And they found that actually it increased the risk of heart attacks, increased cancer, didn't do anything for dementia, and didn't help with weight loss or anything. And so all of a sudden, overnight, 50 million women stopped taking hormones. And, and I think that's the danger of some of these studies. And I, I agree, but it's, it's pretty stunning when you look at the, the disparate views among very respected scientists in this whole world of fat. And, and, and the, one of the areas I wanted to challenge you, you to help us understand is saturated fat. Yes. Because you know, um, I've read and read and read, and I've talked and talked and talked to people, and I'm still like, you know, I have my coconut oil, and I have grass-fed butter, and I'm like, you know, I'm, uh, it's like, am I playing with fire? Is this okay? It raises my cholesterol. Like, what, what do you think about it, and how do we frame that? 
Well, I, again, uh, I love fat, uh, but there are good fats and there are bad fats. Uh, now, of the saturated fats, there's only one particular fatty acid that's a real bad boy, the kind of Dennis Rodman of, of saturated fats, palmitic acid. This is an acid we now know is really basically an underlying cause of a lot of inflammatory uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, areas. Basically, it's really the underlying cause, I believe, of insulin resistance yeah. because yeah. it can now basically cause inflammation in the hypothalamus. Oh, now, some in, the brain, fats, in the brain. In the brain. Yes. So I, I love steric acid because it's rapidly converted in the body to oleic acid. Mm -hmm. I hate palmitic acid. This is like olive oil. Exactly. Right. So this, this is why when you give all saturated fats, cholesterol levels go up except one saturated fat, and that's steric acid mm -hmm. because the body converts it rapidly into oleic acid which is really a non-inflammatory fatty acid. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I like to keep saturated fat content uh, to uh, a low level because that's the only way you can keep palmitic acid low. I love monounsaturated fats. I, I say use just a dash, and I mean a dash of omega-6 fatty acids mm -hmm. and try to get as many omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. And so, I say, oh so my like, God, my head is swimming. Stop, yeah. stop, stop. What do I eat? What do I eat? What do I eat? Like, what does that mean to people? What's well, what, what it means, you know, let's go back uh, three generations. Wait, wait, can I stop you? Before we get to what yes. we, I want to go back to the palmitic acid thing because that's an important little point. So when I began to sort of look at the saturated fat story, I realized there is no such thing as saturated fat. There are saturated fats. They have like a whole right. family of them. And there's like long chain and short chain. There's even chain. There's odd chain. And each of them has different effects, like the coconut oil, lauric acid is different than the margarinic acid from dairy, it's different than the stearic acid from beef, it's different than palmitic acid. And then on top of that, when you look at what happens when you eat saturated fat, actually it doesn't really affect the saturated fats in your blood in the absence of sugar and carbs. So what we, and I wanted you to talk about this a little bit and I want to hear your perspective, but as I began to understand how the body functions and this is just basic biochemistry right it's like when you eat sugar insulin is created which turns on a fat production factory in your liver called lipogenesis you actually convert sugar and carbs into fat and you know what kind of fats saturated fats so you actually increase saturated fats in your blood particularly palmitic acid when you eat sugar so is it really coming from the fat you're eating or is it coming from the carbs and sugar that's the question really well, the, the, the de novo uh, lipogenesis in the liver is a, a very That's a big process. word. That just means like a fat production factory. <laughs> yeah, so, it, so I, again... Not everybody that, listening uh, is a scientist, so yeah. gotta like, i got to help you here. With uh, you know, that's why I told a few scientific things. Oh, he's really smart. I don't know what the word means. You know, so so that's, a lot that's of big how, words. we got to like break it down. <laughs> but that's a, that's a fairly slow process of turning carbohydrates into fat. But the fat that comes out of that uh, lipogenesis is palmitic acid. Right. That's the bad right. boy. Exactly. So, uh, our, so we have two sources. We have you know, excess carbohydrates being turned into palmitic acid. But as we increase the levels of uh, saturated fats in our diet, because palmitic acid is such a major component, we're increasing that also. Mm. And the poor hypothalamus in the brain says, I can't tell the difference. So, uh, so I think I've seen studies where they've actually done controlled studies, where they're feeding studies, where they've actually increased the fat, saturated fats higher and higher as they've decreased the carbs. And it doesn't affect the blood levels of saturated fat. Like, they're not connected. I, I, no, in terms of blood levels, that's true. Like, this is Dr. Bullock's work. But, but in terms of basically its effect on now hormonal responses and inflammation, and that's where basically the, uh, it becomes a little more complex. That's why we, uh, it's oftentimes we take what we see in the blood and say, that's the reality. Say, no, it just. Uh, so that's why uh, a number of our cells, especially the key ones that control appetite, have fatty acid receptors. They can pick up not all fat, saturated fats, but only palmitic acid and say, hey, we got too much, we got some problems here. Yeah. So it's, it's really acting now at these, uh, we now have a, understand a whole area of fatty acid receptors. These are called uh, GRPs, yeah. uh, omega-3 fatty acids, short-chain fatty acids, medium-chain fat, and these are key sensors that the cells are saying, what type of saturated fat is out there? Is it good or bad? Some saturated fats, especially the short-chain saturated fats, are incredibly good. 
Like what? Uh, Where does that come from? Well, uh, most of that, most of those short chain fatty acids. These are the um, uh, the butyric acids. These come from fermentation from of butter. fermentable fiber. From butter. But butter also contains it. So again, uh, you have butter. That's a good source of butyric acid. Uh, fermentable fiber is a good source of butyric acid. And these are very, very useful fatty acids for a wide number of aspects. Right. And so, so what, so, what so, you just said, I want to break it down because I don't think people can connect the dots here. So short-chain fatty acids actually are produced by bacteria in your gut that actually produce these beneficial types of short-chain fats that actually help heal your gut and prevent exactly. inflammation. Right? Exactly. But, but it's not actually fat. It's eating fiber. Certain it's eating, fiber. And this, just not fiber, right. fermentable fiber. Fermentable most fiber, fiber, right. Most of the fiber we eat would be only useful for a termite. Uh, only a small percentage, maybe 15%. So what, is for, what is fermentable fiber? What would I eat to get fermentable fiber? Well, you eat from uh, things such as um, you know, onions, oh. uh, you know, asparagus, all things your grandmother told you to eat. Yeah. Uh, these are fairly rich sources. But this is the food that bacteria in your colon need to basically survive and basically maintain uh, basically a, 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 burnt, a, a strong permeability barrier between the 100 trillion bacteria, like the barbarians at the gate, trying to get into the body and say, back off, buddy, back off. And that, you only do that by keeping a strong, non-leaky gut. Without those short-chain fatty acids, which are the fermentation products, you're going to have a leaky gut, and you're going to have inflammation all day long. So this is a whole new, like, this is a whole new, like, rabbit hole we just went down, right? How exactly. do you, how do you, like... Leaky gut is this new concept that is a really around how do you keep the outside world outside and prevent it from leaking in to your immune system, like food proteins, bacteria, and, and that happens when we injure our gut, and which we do a lot through antibiotics, through antacid drugs, like uh, Pepsid and Prolosec and Zantac, through uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, through hormones, through steroids through stress, through poor diet, through high sugar, low fiber, all these things alter our inner garden, leading to this disruption in this protective barrier, like a, like a, it's like a coffee filter that should let in the good stuff, food and nutrients, and keep out the bad stuff. But that breaks down, and then we actually get in trouble. And what you're saying, really importantly, is that when you eat certain foods, you can actually create healthy fats in your gut because the bacteria are fermenting those foods and then actually producing these good fats which actually acts to seal up the leaky gut preventing exactly. the inflammation which is what you're talking about so the story is sort of complex it's the inflammation comes from the fats you eat but from the fiber you eat and from the fiber you don't eat and i mean this is why you know we write these books to help people figure out okay now what I, it's like I was, I was going to have this concept like WTF should I eat? Like WTF yeah. should I eat? Like yeah. what if you want to know? I don't care. What is all this stuff? What does it mean? And I think that's what, what's so great about your work is that you kind of bring these down into practical solutions for people. Well, and they are complex. And, and that's why one of the problems with nutrition is that we're just at the, the verge of really understanding what's going on. And yet mm -hmm. we think we're a lot, a lot smarter than we really are. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think one of the things we have to basically uh, really – understand we have to be far more humble yeah it's saying you know it's like uh socrates i know nothing right i know nothing and because it's you know it's putting all the pieces together but you end up with something to say i can do it and then you come say wait a minute this is exactly what grandma told me to do three generations ago right. she was a repository of many millennia yeah. of observations of what seems to work Right, it's so true. It's so true. Like one of the, I think that like Michael Pollan says, he says, you know, don't eat anything your grandmother wouldn't eat, or maybe it's your great grandmother now wouldn't eat. Right? Yes. It's like, and what they ate was all organic, all grass fed, all local, all seasonal, high in omega three fats, low in omega six fats, low in sugar, full of fiber. Like these were, this is just what they ate. It wasn't like now it's you have to go to special places to get it and. Whole food, but it was just the food we ate. And since the food industry's taken over, they've corrupted our diet. They've filled it with sugar, filled it with omega six fats. I mean, the two foods that our government funds yes. in high volumes is omega six corn oil. I mean, and corn food and sugar and high fructose corn syrup and soybean oil, which is 
the major crop that we grow in this country in addition to corn. And those two foods are subsidized and they end up causing so much of the downstream problems we're seeing today. However, I'll, I'll basically go one step further. You know, the, the real culprit is not the, the, you know, the evil food industry. It's the average consumer. They said, I want cheap food. I say, we'll give you cheap food. There'll be some collateral damage, hmm. like a lot. But they'll be, say, but it'll be cheap and it'll be very palatable. Hmm. And say, oh, good. I'm going to basically now take the short-term uh, benefits of the hedonic. And say, it tastes good. It's cheap. I love you. But there'll be some very, very significant, and we're seeing it right now, there will be really a, a far greater threat to the security of our country yeah. than any external, uh, you know, uh, you know, a threat we can think of. That's true. I mean, I, I know, you know, my friend Harvey Karp, who's a pediatrician, said, you know, if a foreign country was doing to our kids what the food industry is doing by feeding them the food they're feeding them, we would go to war to protect our children. You would send in the drones. Right. <laughs> send in the drones, you know. And yet, you know, guys like Tom Brady come out and say, you know, we're poisoning our kids with cereal and with Coca-Cola, and he calls them out. And those companies come out like, like you know, an attack dog on him, just trying to discredit him and, and say, you know, these foods are fine, and they've, they're part of a healthy diet, and cereal's a great way to get kids vitamins and nutrients. And I'm like, yeah, you take sugar and frosted flakes, and you put a few vitamins in, and you say it's good. That doesn't mean it's a good food. I say it's like junk it's just a little less junky you know well and again that's why that you know uh yeah this becomes a very very complex problem it, it's really a social economic problem it's a medical problem mm -hmm. uh, but it basically the second largest industry after basically taking care of sick people in our country is pro is the food industry yeah and so basically these are very very powerful uh lobbies that say let's not rock the boat mm -hmm. So again, and as a consequence, Americans are totally confused, totally confused. What should I eat? Yeah. I mean, it's challenging. I mean, I, I actually am I'm doing a public television show today. I mean, I, this, this, this month. And, I, and, I, and I'm creating this show, and I'm writing the script, and I had to send it to the public television guys to check it out. And they like, have their medical experts and all that. You know, and I gave them 500 medical references. And I, and I said, look, the... Uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the main nutrition mouthpiece in America, gets 40% of its funding from the food industry. And I say it's Coca-Cola, it's Kellogg, it's Cargill, it's the makers of high fructose corn syrup and, and soybean oil. And I, and I said, this is a fact. And they're like, oh, no, 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 you can't say Coca-Cola. You can't say Cargill. You can't say Kellogg. I'm like, what do you mean? This is public television which is funded by the public, and what are you afraid of? And they're afraid of the repercussions. And so if public television, which we think of as a sort of left-leaning, independent, socially conscious, you know, voice of the truth, is a terrified of the food industry, we're screwed, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's saying that, uh, and, you know, that's why that, you know, the conferences like this are very important, because... You can say what you feel and say, right. "Here are the facts." It's like, it's like you might not want to hear them, but the facts are the facts. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's let's sort of take a, a turn a little bit, and I want to come back to a couple of things before we close. One is fish oil and omega three fats, and how do we get them? And I know you you've got a, a you know a lot of work on this area because the omega three fats are the fats that come from wild food from fish, but they actually push the hormones in the right direction. They push inflammation in the right direction. And you've talked about even using them therapeutically in chronic diseases or inflammatory diseases. And you've actually even created special types of omega-3 fats. And you understand more about it than almost anybody. And I'd love you to sort of take us through like what they're about, how they work, and how we should get them. And like, what about supplements? Should we just eat sardines or take supplements and how much and all of that stuff? Because well, I don't know. I want to well, know. <laughs> well, well, the first question is how much? Uh, well, the blood will tell you. The blood will tell you how much you need. Uh, so you mean a blood test? You do a blood test? There's a blood test looking for two, the ratio of two fatty acids. Is that the omega-3 index? No, no. No, that's not a very good test. Uh, uh, what uh, is it? And, and the reason why, because you're looking at basically the balance of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory uh, fatty acids. A rocketonic acid is the most pro-inflammatory. I use EPA as the most anti-inflammatory omega-3. So it's you like need a to EPA ratio. Exactly. 
Now, uh, if we look at the, from an epidemiological standpoint, uh, people have a, a low ratio, the Japanese, are the longest lived people in the world today. They have the longest health span, that's longevity minus disability. The lowest rates of heart disease, even though their cholesterol levels are equal to Americans, uh, the lowest rates of depression, and their ratio is about 1.5. Uh-huh. In America, our ratio is about 18. Wow. So I tell you, saying, we're in trouble. So rather than saying how much, they, the blood will tell you. You titrate the goal, just like you would for a drug. You titrate the goal. So it's your and, overall diet plus supplements. Exactly. So uh, say, well, why don't you eat more fish? Well, you have two problems. One, it's hard to eat enough fish. You need about two and a half grams per day. That's what the Japanese eat. Uh, Americans eat about 125 milligrams. So I say you've got a problem there. Uh, second of all, uh, to get 200 is that, and... Is that, is that two grams of EPA, DHA, or two grams of fish oil? Two grams of EPA and DHA. Yeah. So now if like you want... a fish oil to, capsule might have a thousand or one, milli, one gram, but I don't know, it might have like 300 exactly. milligrams of EPA, so you need like, like a, a gazillion. lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but to get, to get uh, say, two and a half grams, you might eat, um, let's say, six pounds of lobster per day. Gets oh. so expensive. Or how about uh, two pounds of uh, tuna per day? Come on. You have mercury oh, yeah. poisoning. Oh, yeah, exactly. Or how about, uh, let's say, only maybe uh, 300 grams of salmon every day for the rest of your life? What about little, sardines? Uh, Could you have, like, sardines every day? Yeah, but you both have problems. There's no fish in the world today that's not contaminated with both mercury and PCBs. Mm -hmm. You can run, but you can't hide. Mm -hmm. So you've got some problems because now we know the more PCBs you take in, and we'll talk about nanograms of material, you yeah. raise heart disease by about 60%. Yeah. So purified fish oils become a way of getting around this problem. Yeah. Uh, but again, how much you need, the blood will tell you. So how do you, how do you get that blood test? Because your doctor's well, not doing it. Well, that's why you're right. You're the blood won't, and people hate to give blood. That's why they have their annual physical every five years. <laughs> uh, uh, I need to get blood. So you had to develop a finger stick test. Say, ah, a drop of blood, and I can tell. Now, there are a number of companies that basically have that you can just buy online. So you can ascertain where am I and where do I have to go. So we're going to share after this a resource section as part of the summit. And we're going to put in where you can get this test because I think everybody's going to want to know that. And because it becomes now, if you do only one test, in my opinion, only one test, blood test in your entire life, that's the test you so want to do. So what's the ratio B? You want it to be, be about 1.5. It's like you want to be a Japanese guy. Exactly. Now, if you do, uh, when we talk about therapeutic doses to bring the ratio down to that level, then you see these remarkable changes. Uh, you probably saw a recent article in the New York Times. Fish oil supplements don't work. Yeah, of course. Well, it, it was based upon a study that uh, looked at fish oil supplements in terms of people with um, <clears throat> macular degeneration. Yeah. For five years, they gave them no change in uh, vision. Yeah. But they're using a placebo dose. Once right. we did the, the, the same study and used a therapeutic dose, you see these dramatic changes in vision in six months. So what you're saying is like if you give a milligram of aspirin, it's not going to work for your headache, right? Exactly. But if you give 325 exactly. milligrams, your headache's going to go away. And they, and they, So it's like the study was set up to fail. Exactly. And so that's why we have to treat, begin to treat food Say, what is the food or agent we need, and what's a therapeutic dose? Yeah, wow. It's, uh, it's, we, we have to get away from saying, oh, it's, we can't talk about this. Of course you have to talk about therapeutics. This is basically food controls our future. So There's no like more a powerful drug, drug, right, than food. It, it, the, and it basically we know how to handle it. We don't know how to handle uh, pharmaceuticals very well, but right. we can handle food pretty well. Right. So, so what should people take? Should they take like two grams of fish oil a day as supplements? And should it, what ratio of EPA and DHA? Like, what should it be? I always like to use a two to one ratio because you need them both. They do, do different things. Mm -hmm. But that's why how much should you take? It depends how much inflammation you have and where it's located. Uh, if you're normal, yeah, two and a half grams per day. That's good. Uh, but what if you're not normal? You're obese. You have heart disease. You've got diabetes. You have more inflammation. What if you have rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah. What if you have now basically depression? ADHD, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's. The inflammation is now in the central nervous system. You still need more. The blood will tell you 
and you titrate the goal. Amazing. So what you're saying, just to break it down, is that, and you just created like a list of things that I don't want to skip over, which is that when you look at the role of omega-3 fats, they influence your mood, your memory, your attention, your weight, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, like everything, right? Because everything is really revolves around inflammation. And that's why I like to use high dose because at higher doses, they not are no longer anti-inflammatory, they are pro-resolution. Right. You know, yeah, inflammation doesn't burn out like a, a log. It so, keeps on burning, 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 until there's an active process called resolution that right. turns off the fires. So all our fear of fat is sort of unfounded, right? It's like, it's no longer a four-letter word, right? It's like... <laughs> it's a, it's a three-and-a-half-letter word. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, some of our word. fear of certain fats are justified. Of course, right. Uh, other fats are not. So again, it's a, it's a lot more complex, but put it simply, fat is the key to your future. Mm. So, so help us understand a little bit more. You talked about EPA and DHA. There's like your long words like cosapentanoic acid, docosapentanoic acid. These are long chemical words, but like we know about them. How are they different? What do they do? And why do you need both of them? And where do you get them? Well, they all, they all come from basically fish, uh, but they do different things. Uh, the EPA is more anti-inflammatory than the DHA. The DHA, what it does, it basically uh, makes things more fluid, like in the brain. Yeah. That's, that's why you find high levels in the brain to basically make the synapses more readily to take up and pull back neurotransmitters. So basically you have fish for brains. Exactly. That's why your grandma said, eat your fish, it's brain food. She was right. And so uh, I, these are things we have to have. And if we go back to Paleolithic times, our best estimate that our Paleolithic ancestors consumed about six grams a day of omega-3 fatty acids. Mm, amazing. So, so Barry, I want to I ask you something. You, you wrote The Zone in 1995. You've written a new book called The Mediterranean Zone. And I, I'm wondering, how has your thinking changed? And like... What have you learned and like what's different and what should we be doing? What does is, what is an average day of eating look like based on your concepts? Well, the, the zone really hasn't changed in the last 20 years. But what has changed is our knowledge. When I wrote the zone in 1995, our knowledge of polyphenols was zip, nothing. So what are polyphenols? Now we know they're, polyphenols are the chemicals that give fruits and vegetables their color. Now, why do we know they're powerful? Because they activate genes. Ah. And these are the genes that turn on the enzymes that are antioxidative enzymes. They turn off inflammation, and they basically slow down the aging process. But mm. only if you have enough. Mm. And so the book, The Mediterranean Zone, was not about the Mediterranean diet. It's really about a book about polyphenols, oh. why they're yeah. important, why you need lots of amount. And this is why the key of the uh, Mediterranean diet was saying it's one that's rich in polyphenols. It could be richer and better, but basically that's the reason why it has its health benefits. That's so great. You know, what you said there is like a whole other concept, right? Which is fats regulate hormones, fats regulate genes, and if you eat the right fats, you can turn on all the anti-aging, anti-disease genes. But also what you're saying is it's a whole other world of colorful plant foods, like the rainbow of colors is actually where this other medicinal qualities in food lives, which is, I call it the phytonutrient index. What are the, and I don't mean phyto is in your dog, I mean phyto is in plant which is hey. plant nutrients that are not vitamins and minerals, are not carbs, fats, or protein. There's other stuff with these long names, but they're, they're actually modulating everything in your body all the time. I, I, and I, I say in the book, I think within 10 or 15 years, we'll realize that polyphenols are essential nutrients. Yeah. Uh, they're essential nutrients for us, but they're even more essential for keeping our 100 trillion bacteria in the gut happy. Yeah. And uh, that's why we have to have adequate levels of polyphenols every day to basically maintain homeostasis. That's right. Well, that's, you know, that's what I, I think about. Like, how did this happen? Like, and, I, and as we evolve, our, our biology is pretty lazy, right? If we don't have to make stuff, we don't make it, right? If we don't have to make vitamin C, then we don't. Like, a lot of animals make vitamin C, but we don't because we get it from our food. So, if, if, and, and in fact, you know, even look at your bacteria. You've got, you know, maybe... You know, 10 times as many bacteria as your cells. You've got 100 times as much bacterial DNA as your own DNA. And you're lazy. You've got about as many genes as an earthworm. But we're more complex. How? Because we're borrowing the genetic machinery of these, you know, this 2 million genes or 3 million genes of bacteria that live inside us to run all sorts of stuff in our body. And the, oh, way, exactly. to, 
and, and we're only so beginning what, to touch, touch on this. And this is why we have so much, you know, basically hubris. We think we're really special. Yeah. We're really basically a, a very large bacterial colony walking around in an outer sheath of That's human right. cells. We're just, a, we're just a carrier for these bacteria. And what you're saying is like these polyphenols actually are fertilizing and helping these things work better in our gut. Well, not, not fertilizing. Uh, the, 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 uh, the prebiotics will be the fertilizer. But what the polyphenols are, are the landscape gardener. Ah, yes. They're determining what plants stay, what plants go. And yeah, the, the bad guys out, the good guys, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you around, and basically we'll, be, we'll work out together. And they also, they also not only do that, but they also regulate our, our detoxification in our liver. They regulate inflammation. Like you've talked about curcumin. You talk about rosemary. You talk about all these, you know, capacin from, from hot peppers. You talk about these are resveratrol from red wine. You talk about you know all these different polyphenols that are from these plant foods that we know actually have profound benefits. And it's all about eating delicious, colorful, yummy food. You know, but but now it comes back to that you know the the amount. How much do you need? Yeah, you need a lot. Yeah. So uh, what's a good rule of thumb? How to get enough polyphenols? Plan to eat two pounds a day of colorful carbohydrates, vegetables, a, vegetables. primarily vegetables, a little fruit. You don't mean like you don't mean like pink cake. You mean like because you know, <laughs> people are like, oh, I can have the uh, the red donut. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that looks like an apple to me. But but you need because polyphenols are in very low concentration, so you have to get a therapeutic dose. So and you recommend, uh, that, like, you recommend like like Vitamix like like smoothies with vegetables or yeah, if you want to eat about the, you know, drink about the fifteen gallons a day. Well, how do you get it? Through supplements? Through diet? Like through- well, well, diet, if you're willing to eat the two pounds of vegetables, uh, you could probably do it. Uh, but, uh, again, this is where the whole area of polyphenol extracts. Like, one of the most interesting ones are those from cocoa. Chocolate. chocolate Who doesn't yeah. like chocolate? Yeah. Uh, here's, here's a little dirty secret about chocolate. Every dark chocolate bar known to mankind is rich in cadmium and lead. Every chocolate bar. So I say, would you like your chocolate bar with or without lead paint chip? What? Tell me about that. Well, uh, uh, again, because uh, the cocoa beans themselves basically do pick up a lot of cadmium and lead because they're grown in a very narrow geographic location and it's almost impossible to get rid of it. You can only get rid of it by making extracts. Now, the leader of the field, surprisingly, is a company called Mars. Yes. And they had recent publications using their cocoa extracts free of cadmium and free of lead, that at very high levels, they have, have dramatic effects yeah. on terms of basically memory and basically brain function. Yeah, but you have to have special chocolate, and it's not a Mars bar. No, but, 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 the, but the special chocolate, the darker the chocolate, the more of the cadmium, the more of the lead. In fact, a number of uh, companies, very high-end companies, are being sued in the wow. state of California for having uh, violating what's called Prop 65, in their levels of cadmium. That's a bummer, Barry, because like I love chocolate. <laughs> but, 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 but again, it says now science can help us say we know what the active ingredient in chocolate is. We can purify it, and then we can do clinical trials and say, my God, it works. Well, I just have to take enough. So that, we only have a few minutes left, Barry. What, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? That's what I want to well, know. I call and what these supplements do you take? <laughs> uh, well, as few as possible. Uh, I think the ones basically have any you know, clinical benefits. But what do I usually eat? Here's a good breakfast. I might eat an eight egg white omelet, throw a little guacamole on there, and have maybe a half a cup of slow-cooked oatmeal, and throw some blueberries in there. That's okay. breakfast. Why uh, egg white omelets? Because like, I thought we now know that cholesterol is like off the bad no, list. No, no, but basically, the, uh, remember we talked about arachidonic acid? Yeah. The yolk is the richest source of Arachidonic acid. Ah. If you go all this effort to get rid of arachidonic acid, don't put it in your mouth like foie gras. Uh, for lunch, I might have four ounces of chicken breast, three to four cups of cooked vegetables, oh. and maybe a, you know, a, you know, a little olive oil, like a tablespoon. Mm. For dinner, maybe six ounces of um, grilled fish, another three to four cups of vegetables, some more olive oil, and another half cup of berries for dessert. So I didn't hear I didn't hear beans in there. I didn't hear grains. I didn't hear bread. I didn't hear anything that like is what what people think of as staples of their diet, right? That's right. But potato. what did your grandmother say? She said you can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. That's right. That's right. Now, as far as supplements, the ones I take 
are, again, extracts of polyphenols and extracts of omega-3 fatty acids. But I test my blood all the time. Mm-hmm. And there are certain blood markers that will tell you whether you're in the zone or not. It's not some mystical place. So what it's about the polyphenols? Place. Like you can do the amer- arachidonic acid to EPA ratio for fat. And what do you do for vegetables? Well, the, the best way to lo- know if you're eating enough, A1C. Uh-huh. And so say, because what is, it's really a, a, a linkage of carbohydrates, but big, as really free radicals. So if you're having a lot of antioxidants in the blood, you reduce A1C. Uh, so what so, you're saying, A1C is the level of your average blood sugar for six weeks. So that's what we use for that, diabetics, but it's really... You want, want to keep it about five. And you know from your own experience, keeping uh, A1C at five is hard work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very hard. Very hard. And so, and so those are goals. Get your, get your ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA about 1.5. Basically, keep your A1C at five. I don't care how you do it. If you're pulling your earlobe three times a day and you're doing it, you keep pulling the earlobe. It's working. Now, and, now, and how old are you, Barry, now? Now I'm now 68. Amazing. So how do you feel? I feel pretty good. Yeah, and your I, weight's yeah, I, good? I, you feel good? Yeah, again, uh, you know, I'm not in jail. This is, this, this, you know, uh-huh. your life is good. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. I, I encourage everybody to go check out Dr. Sears new book, The Mediterranean Zone. And, and where can we learn more about your work and, and find out about what you're doing? Do you have a website, a Facebook page? Well, s- several websites. Uh, again, the, the uh, talking about just the practicalities, they go to zonediet.com. Hmm. And to learn more about the uh, inflammation in general, they go to drsears.com. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Sears, for your pioneering work, for helping us understand that food is medicine and the role of fats and omega-3 fats and helping us clarify some of this confusion today. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for the opportunity of being on your show. Of course. More from Dr. Sears. Stay tuned.